Hello everybody, my name is Zachariah Van Sliders. I am the founder here at Old Man Gaming. I'm really excited to bring some, some video game content. We've been kind of overwhelmed with the TTRPG stuff. Uh, but uh, it's time to get some video game content in your face. And how better to do that than another episode of After 50. What is After 50? Well, we do reviews here when I get my, uh, my hands on the game, but we call them Snap Judgment Reviews. Basically what the idea of those things are is that I just try to give you an idea whether you're going to enjoy right off the bat and I only do like five to ten hours so like uh, when I have a game that I actually commit more than 50 hours to something that really calls my time and I jump around a lot so it takes a lot uh, I'm going to start doing these after 50 reviews kind of looking back on games that I've uh, already probably reviewed for snap judgment um, but I've put the time in to really see what it's like and then just kind of like re-refresh and re-go over it. Uh, in a lot of ways, just kind of pay homage sometimes. So the game we're doing, as you've probably seen on your screen already, is uh, Age of Wonders 4. So something you guys should know about me, um, if you're relatively new to the channel, is I have a soft spot for 4X games. We don't do a ton of content here on the channel with them, uh, just because they don't always make the best content. Um, I do a stream right now, and I'm, I'm playing Age of Wonders 4, but that stream's kind of a, a rotating game stream anyway, so we don't do a ton of content with that. But I personally have a soft spot for a really good 4X game. I love the idea of like watching a race that you create or a civilization that you create kind of come up from nothing and uh, uh, where they end um in, in the very end of things it's just always exciting to me it always it always gets gets my blood flowing and age of wonders 4 has to be probably in my opinion the best appearance of that ever now age of wonders 4 is produced by paradox uh it comes from triumph studios uh and paradox is just like the all-encompassing uh kind of god of of producing strategy games they do crpgs they do tons of 4x games uh grand strategy games uh this is kind of their forte um although i will say oftentimes as much as i enjoy their games uh there's there's usually a big problem with it stellaris was one that i was really into and then uh, once i got later into kind of a playthrough um there was this like vassalization system that just kind of ruined it for me so I ended up not sticking with it um, but Age of Wonders 4 grabbed my attention and hasn't let go so let's get into what it is uh, Age of Wonders 4 other than just being a 4x game what you are is you're playing this character who has kind of transcended normal life you've become uh, what they call a wizard king um, wizard kings kind of travel between realms and uh, kind of take them over they take power from them uh, they govern them some of them are good some of them are bad basically they're kind of a god uh, that's that's the idea behind it as a wizard king you basically will manage a fantasy race uh, from scratch and uh, what kind of fills in for the spot of like technology trees from civilization are tomes of magic those tomes of magic gives you different spells that allow you to cast that give you the technology so it basically takes civilization but replace technology with magic because this is a, this is a very fantasy oriented game uh, you kind of create the game uh, create the race from the ground up which is really cool from tons of different races uh, also I have I have recently played probably about 20 to 40 hours post the final DLC which was uh, Eldritch Realms um, and they have added tons of stuff since the original you know game launch uh, there are tons of playable races at least eight that I know of um, and then when you're creating your champion, your wizard king, they've also added dragon lords that you can play. Like you can play full fledged giant dragons. Uh, and then they also added what's called an eldritch sovereign. So like this giant Cthulhu god, uh, which is just both are really cool to me. 
uh, really cool ads, and I think it's just really fun to, to kind of try and play those. Uh, you can also pick a champion, which is just somebody who, a human who has ascended from that realm, um, or a wizard king who's somebody who's traveled from another realm to kind of govern a people. Um, you, we get into the really interesting stuff when we get into the customization of the games. You can edit almost everything. Personally, I have kind of found my sweet spot as having the game randomly generate the realm and then finding out what traits the realm has as you go through. But there's all sorts of things from lakes of impassable lava to different patterns of, of how the earth sits in in the oceans and rivers. There's overgrown forests. There's realms that are still being created as you're fighting through them. Arctic realms, swamp realms. Runs the entire gambit of potential traits. And I love the idea that I could just play a random one and discover the traits as I go along. Um, but you... But if you're not one of those people, you can customize this thing down to the letter. Put every trait you want in there or lack thereof. You also get to decide how many AI or computer characters there are in the realm. Um, uh, you can uh, uh, um, decide how many of them there are. I think the largest map they have, you can have up to eight full armies. Uh, in there, or full civilizations in there vying for control, but you can still pick a large map with a small amount of, of civilizations, so it's it's not really heavy. Um, you can also pick how heavy the world is, how many just random independents you're going to face, all of that sort of thing. Um, and then the really cool part is the race customization, which we will talk about later when I do all the pros and cons, but the race customization is phenomenal in this. You can create fantasy races from the start to ground. The only thing I'll say is there's a lack of colors if you don't get mods, and I actually recommend you don't get mods on this because uh, the mods change with the updates. It's very frustrating. It actually broke some of my games that I hadn't finished yet. Uh, usually it doesn't like, I could just, like, take the mods off and it'll be fine. But with this, like, if I took the mods off, the game was still broken. Uh, so I had to delete the whole character if I wasn't finished yet, and that was just a bummer. So I tend to avoid mods. For now, I think, like, when this game is, like, all complete, go crazy with mods. But for now, I would avoid them. I just got burned with them. Um, that being said, other than the lack of, kind of, colors, there's just so many different races. Humanoid and sex... Uh, animal races, you've got your straight fantasy races like elves and orcs and goblins. It's just so many things you can create and play. What's even more interesting is all of those races start with kind of a standard set of traits that are just like with the race. Like the, the lizards are cold-blooded and, you know, the, 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 uh, the insects have like maybe like a venom or something. I don't have it in front of me, so I can't remember offhand, but like something like that. You can trade those up. So you can customize your race. Like you say like, well, I'm playing hobbits, but they have like lizard blood. Then like you can do that. Um, then you get into the, kind of the customization of the race. And, and what's even cooler is you can kind of tweak how big or small they are. You can have tall hobbits or short orcs. Uh, there's really no end to the interesting stuff you can do here, especially if you have all four DLCs, which is a hefty price tag uh, attached to all of those, but I'm not going to lie, I kind of think it's worth it. I paid, I want to say $60 for the original base game, and then since then I pay, bought the, the season pass once they were all out for 40 so it's like two games, and I feel like it's the sequel meshed in with the first one, which... It's really exciting to me and has really given me a lot of stuff to do when playing this game for the foreseeable future. Rarely will I say it's worth it to spend that much money on a game, but I actually kind of feel like it is in this one. There's just endless replayability here. All right, so let's go ahead and get into the pros and the cons for the second time around. Um, the first thing I'm going to say, I like to go positive first, so I'm, of course, going to talk about the pros. Uh, the race creation is just phenomenal there's so much choice here and i haven't even really given you guys a good scope of what you can do here i mean in addition to just picking your race you also pick what their culture is how they interact with other civilizations you can pick the ai for the leader of the race so that the race can show up later in other games that you play which is even cooler but you also pick like like not just appearance but like how this race exists 
like what their culture is. And I think that's just so cool. Uh, and it, it, it even brings me my, my next pro, which is the versatility of the system here. There are so many ways to play this game. Everything works the same way, obviously. Like, it's a lot of spreadsheets, and here's your city. What are you building in your city? What are you training in your city? You know, uh, how is your city advancing? That sort of thing. But there's all these different aspects to it. Um, just a good example, I'm playing two games right now. One of them is, uh, they're, they're, they're both bad guys. One of them is these ritualistic, cannibalistic, barbarian crocodiles. Um, like croco humans. Um, so they're just all about the blitzkrieg and the fighting. And they don't do magic. It's all about money generation with them, and they they actually get a lot of money because they're very chaos organized. So they get a lot of money from just pillaging and destroying like neighboring villages. Whereas I have another race, also evil, unfortunately. But uh, I, I, my first two characters were good, so I'm kind of trying something else out. Uh, another race of crows, like short crow type people that I call the carrion, that uh, are all about magic and undead uh, and necromancy. So they're almost, their military is all about if they destroy other people in armies, they can then raise them as skeletons. So they get this crazy amount of like swarm kind of uh, uh, mechanics to them. Um, but they both play completely differently. How you use the, the 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 soul energy from the necromancy compared to just the raw power of your your units. Uh, there's just so many different facets to this game. So many different builds. Um, which this also brings me to a learning uh, a con later. But we'll get back to that when we go into cons. <coughs> The other two things I really want to shout out here, and one of the things that really attached me to this game, is first the war mechanics. Um, so this game is twofold. Not only is it grand strategy, but when you run into other armies, um, you can manually do the combat and go down to a battlef battlefield level where it almost becomes a tactics RPG. Um, I love this. I love this aspect of it. Uh, if there is any complaint I have about a game like Civilization or something, it's just you see the armies walk across the field, they run into the other armies, one of the armies falls over. Uh, with this, you really get into like not just the overwhelming, overarching, grand strategy thing, you also get into the battlefield mechanics, and good mechanics can win, a good strategy can win or lose you a fight. Which I think is really enjoyable. And don't worry, people out there, if you feel that takes too much time or you don't want to go into that level, they do have an auto combat where you can just click it and it decides kind of based on the power of the both armies, which armies win. Kind of more in kin with your, your civilization games. And then f finally, I cannot quote this woman enough. She is the best. They have a narrator for this. Uh... Not for the opening CG, but a narrator who every time you pick a tome kind of reads you a quote from the tome. Um, she's phenomenal. I cannot remember her name. I actually nominated her, nominated her for our Video Game Awards last year. I don't know if she made the final cup, but I love her. She's great. She just really, like, I never skip that dialogue ever. And as it being the only, like, spoken voice lines of the game, truly awesome truly awesome uh and then finally we get into some cons uh the cons uh win conditions uh they're, they're not really great guys it's hard to explain why i don't like the win conditions but uh there's score which i hate you can disable that in the customization but that just basically means there's a certain number of turns when those turns ex uh, expires the arbitrary score uh, that the game has given your empire uh, decides who wins, who loses. Uh, other than that, there are three win conditions. There's a military victory, which is your classic I'm the last one standing sort of thing. You wipe out all the other uh, civilizations other than your own. There is the magic victory, uh, which you have to uh, train yourself in magic to, I think, at least tier level three or four of your tombs uh, and then you can learn a spell called bind 
ancient gold wonders. Then you have to go into these things called ancient wonders. You have to claim those ancient wonders. Then you have to bind them to yourself. Uh, very huge process, which means also building a city next to it. Uh, then there's the expansion video of, of victory, which means you and your alliance members uh, claim more than half the provinces on the map. So I think it's like in in a large in a large game, it's like 180 provinces. Uh, and then you have to light, you have to build and light these three beacons, um, and then things spawn to kill those beacons, and you have to protect them for like I want to say like ten turns or something insane. Uh, there is also a, um, and then finally there's the um, the seals victory, which are these like places on the map. Uh, I do random map traits, so this is one that you have to have seals active on your trait map, and then uh, once you have somebody on them, you start to gain points every round. Uh, and then uh, the amount you have uh, with people on them gives you extra points, and I think it's something crazy depending on the size of the, uh, the, the, the map, like 300 points or whatever, until a victory. Um, the wind conditions are just weird to me. I, it's very hard for me to put my finger on what I it, like or dislike about them. I One of the big things I don't like, and I don't know if this is ever true because the first time it happened to me, I stopped playing with score victory, but uh, you can't win uh, an allied victory with scored victory, which is super frustrating. Um, the person with the highest score just wins, even if you're in an alliance with them. Uh, so I, I, the first time that happened to me, I turned scored victory off. I've never gone back. Uh, so I don't know if that's something that was fixed or not. But uh, I do like that you can have allied victories with your other cohorts. You don't have to like then fight over who's going to actually win it. Uh, I also like that because of that allied victory thing, uh, one thing I always hated in Civilization is you'd start to get close to a victory and then all of your alliances would just break and everybody on the map would attack you. Uh, that doesn't happen here because if you win, they win. Uh, if you're in an alliance with them, if they're not, they're going to come after you. But otherwise, no. Um, still, just there's just so complex with the win conditions that I tend to end up allying myself with other character, other AI things, and kind of waiting for them to get to the uh, to the to the victory um, and aiding them in that. I think of the two characters that I've won with. Um, both of them, both of them, I, uh, I was allied with somebody who went for an expansion victory and I just helped them protect the beacons until I won. Uh, I do have, like I said, two races right now that are looking to potentially take a military or expansion victory on their own, but, um, only time will tell. It just, there's so many steps to them that I feel like if you have skill score turned on, it's always going to end in a score. And if you don't have score turned on, it gets a little tedious to try and figure out how to win in the ways that they want you to win, basically. Uh, moving on. Uh, the next one's got to be the learning curve. Look, this game is spreadsheets on spreadsheets on spreadsheets. I have finally got the hang of it after like a hundred and some hours. Uh, and I'm still like, oh, I could have done this the whole time. Or, oh, I found this option that I didn't know about. Um, there's just so much to this game that I think it would be very hard for somebody coming in to just pick it up and play. I will say they have some nice color coding here and some nice flashy accoutrement that's going to keep somebody in, uh, such as all the random events that spark up that are really cool governing events for your, your race uh, and your main character. And then my only other uh, weird kind of uh, thing is they have all these playable races, um, but they never really added more uh, fantasy characters. Um, there was a lot of like animals that they added uh, with Primal Fury and Dragon Dawn and all of that stuff, but uh, I'd love a kobold playable race or a gnoll playable race. Uh, there's there's a lot of straight a pixie or a fairy playable race there's a lot of like straight fantasy creatures that i don't think are getting their due here um and i'd love to see them represented in this game uh don't get me wrong i'm a huge tmnt fan so 
I love all the like hybrid animal races. I think they're really cool. I just uh, I think that we could pay a little bit more tribute to some of the classic fantasy races that aren't in here uh, that are possibly lesser known but just as exciting. Uh, so that's it. Uh, I'm definitely going to keep playing Age of Wonders 4. I love this game. Um, it's my favorite 4X game of all time as it stands right now. I don't see anything kind of uh, usurping it. Um, and I'm not even a fantasy guy. Uh, it's just a great, great, fun, creative, interesting game. As long as you can get past the learning curve and the complicated win, win conditions. So that's it. It's the After 50 on Age of Wonders 4. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, you can check out our shirts at wizardsrestbike.com. We got a new one up. Uh, the algorithm proof shirt. It's very exciting. Um, and uh, yeah. Other than that, you can reach us on Facebook at DH on Twitter at OmegaGaming9. You can join our Discord links in the description below. Influence this and all of our shows from there. So as you guys keep watching and listening, we'll keep making them. We'll see you guys next time.